Hello and welcome to the Mio on MMA podcast. I think my voice is a little bit off today. It sounds off to me, but we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll find out when I'm editing, I guess. And uh, yeah, we had uh, we had a big week of fights. PFL one, UFC Vegas ninety. I don't have much to say about any of the three cards, honestly. Uh, I will talk about the PFL one a little bit. I will go into the UFC Vegas ninety card in depth because that's probably what you're here for. And just a quick note, uh, John Jones, the biggest uh, MMA story of the week, threatening to kill a drug tester. And his defense is actually the most hilarious thing about this, because normally, normally when you get accused of killing someone, you have your own like version of events, right? You have your own ideas and whatever. With with this, uh, John Jones is like just uh, basically saying the drug tester was rude. And showed up very early, although evidence suggests it was 4 p.m. So perhaps the weakest defense I think John Jones has ever had. Weaker than the dodgy dick pill defense. Because at least that was a defense. It just was one that probably didn't make him look great. This is just more like, yeah, I totally did it. But uh, they were rude to me. <laughs> um, I don't know. It went, uh, anyone shocked by what John Jones does anymore should, uh, I don't know, should just review the re- review the past conduct of John Jones, I guess. I don't know. Let's start with the PFL card. I don't. I, I literally have nothing to say about the one card, although Ben Tienan won. So, hey, that's cool. That's cool. That's awesome. But uh, we'll talk about the PFL one pretty uh, quickly. My picks went pretty well on this one, much better than on the UFC card. I went, let's see here, 12 fights. I picked up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight wins and one maybe. I honestly don't remember what I settled on with Daniel James and Marcelo Gold as my pick. Uh, someone can tell me in the comments, I guess. I, I could just listen to my own podcast. That would make sense. But uh, that was a fight that I was treating as a toss-up anyways. James had beaten Golm before. Golm does feel like the more structured and reliable fighter because Daniel James is very, very unreliable. There's a reason he's 15-7 and seven now. Uh, he did win this fight, though. But he is exceptionally violent and um, lethal. There you go. Lethal. But aside from that, he's uh, unstructured and pretty pretty much a mess. But uh, he got the job done here today. One of my losses, though, was a big one. Uh, There was a comment comment on my YouTube, probably right about when that fight happened. Uh, Oh, my God, Litton Vassal's lost. And, uh, yeah, Litton Vassal did lose to Dennis Goldstoff. So there goes my heavyweight pick. So, Valentin Moldovsky beat Ante Delia in the first round. Apparently, leg kicked him so hard that he injured his groin. Uh, Delia's groin, that is. And, like I said, Goldstoff winning by TKO in the third round. Liz Carmouche beat Juliana Velasquez for the third time. Dakota Ducheva, the most uh, lock pick of the entire card, too. Something like a minus 1,200 or something favorite. Uh, hang on, what's Tapology got? I'm not going to pull up the uh, the uh, the best fight odds, but minus 2,500. Yeah, so I was underselling it uh, against Lisa Malden. She uh, stopped her in the first round, 3 minutes and 45, 54 seconds. Punch to the body and ground strikes was good. Uh, Daniel James, like I said, stopping Marcelo Gold with one second to go in the first round. Surprisingly enough, uh, Sergey, who I still cannot say his last name with any sense of confidence, Confidence. Bilo Steny versus Blago Yuvinov. Beat Blago Yuvinov by decision. Never going to finish Blago Yuvinov. Man is the toughest man alive. Tyler Santos made short work of Alar Joan. Oleg Popov wound up with a TKO from Crucifix over Steve Mowry. So he moves to 17 and 1. Might be a dark horse in the tournament, honestly. Kano Watanabe won a decision against uh, Shanna Young. Jenna Bishop got an armbar submission against Chelsea Hackett. And the big upset of the card, and maybe the biggest upset we've seen in like some time, because I'm pretty sure Lucas Brennan, yeah, it was like a minus 1,600 favorite. He lost to Dimitri Ivey by decision, which is stunning. You don't usually get it that way. Normally, if you get a big upset, it's like, you know, some kind of wild and wacky finish, catching an arm bar or a guillotine or something of that kind uh, of that note. Maybe a, maybe a hot strike or something. But no, he he just won a decision. He just He just beat him. Uh, Bryce Meredith beat Ty Johnson by decision, which not surprising, but like I was kind of hoping for a finish, (laughs) but Bryce Meredith is not really a finisher. That's kind of just how that works. So anyways, 
That was the PFL card. Did pretty well on it. The UFC card, not so great. UFC Vegas, 90. There was some good on this card. For example, the performance of Yamatsumoto, I really enjoyed. Cesar Almeida versus Dylan Budka was not a good fight, but I am impressed with what Almeida did. They're both two guys coming off the Contender Series that my concern with Matsumoto was you look pretty good, but you're not like finishing people and you're not a stunning athlete and you haven't fought a high level of competition. So what do you do with Dan Arquetta? You beat him. There you go. Nice. So solid. Uh, Cesar Almeida was able to stop Dylan Becker's takedowns and get the job done. I still think it was a bad matchmaking idea to put him up against somebody who was just going to drive him into the cage and try and stall him. But uh, hey, you know what? He he got the job done. So those were the highlights. Uh, well, also Nora, Nora Cornole beating uh, Melissa Mullins. That was pretty good. I started this card off 3-0-3. and uh, oh and three. Ooh. Oh, and I was, uh, I was oh, actually 0-4 oh because I uh, did not have 0-5 oh actually. Anyways, I didn't have a pick on Hugo versus Pedro Falcaos because that was made super short notice. And then I lost on the dumont Duranami fight. So like, and then Bresky versus Walker. So I was 0-5 oh before Morono picked up a victory. But Cornoli picked up a good win. Almeida picked up a good win. Matsumoto picked up a good win. And looking on up, there wasn't much else, honestly. Now, not that there weren't, Good fights. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed Chris Curtis versus Brennan Allen, too. I enjoyed Chepe Mariscal versus Morgan Charrier. I enjoyed Ignacio Bahamandes, particularly the finish against Chris Dos Chiagos. And there were some very, very enjoyable parts of Charlie Campbell versus Trevor Peak. But those were all expected. It's, it's like, you know, I was expecting Chepe Mariscal versus Morgan Charrier to be a really, really fun fight. So it's not really a, it's not really a high moment because it, it just... It kind of did what it was supposed to do. And then with Bahamundes and Jagos, same thing. Campbell Peak, same thing. Curtis versus Allen was always going to be interesting. So again, same thing. So there wasn't really much outside of those early, early highlights. So this is a card that started pretty hot, honestly. Was out there delivering and giving us some prospects to cheer for in the future. Or at least up and coming fighters. New faces to mix in with the ranked fighters. Because Nora Cornole is not really a prospect at 34 years old i would also argue that you know cesar almeida at 36 years old obviously not a prospect either uh, so only really matsumoto meet, meeting that criteria but you know fun fights new faces people to mix it up and have some fun with so let's talk about judging because that was the highlight of this or, or the, the 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 talking point coming out of this card because there were some scorecards that people had varying levels of problems with the main event was one Allen versus Curtis a lot of people scored for Chris Curtis I did I scored it uh 48 47 for Chris Curtis I gave Brendan Allen the first round and the I want to say fourth round yeah I gave him the first and the fourth you could give him the fifth because of course it ended with the weird hamstring injury and it's like is that damage is that a freak injury how do you account for that so I actually don't really have much of a problem with Allen winning and if we look at the uh, UFC stats, just to put some numbers to it, I like my numbers. Uh, the first round was Allen outlanding uh, Curtis, and Curtis not really having a lot of great, um, you know, not having the feel yet. And that's pretty typical. Curtis tends to start relatively slow, and Allen took the first round, much like he did in the first fight. Second round, that was Curtis's best round. It was weird. Somebody on Twitter was uh, was debating with me about like how the third round was the one that really was the lock for Curtis. And how the second round was kind of a push round. I don't understand how Curtis would lose the second round. He outlanded him 46 to 29. He outlanded, he had heavier strikes because he's Chris Curtis and he's fighting Brendan Allen. There's an obvious thing there. Allen had no takedowns. He went 0 for 1, had seven seconds of control, I guess, against the cage, probably. So, like, it was definitively the round for Chris Curtis. He had it going. He had the counters going. He was piecing Allen up pretty effectively, outlanding him. Not two to one, but like one and a half to two sort of thing. And we know he's also the heavier striker. And he was also going to the body at this point and getting work done there. Round three, I also gave to Chris Curtis. He lost most of <laughs> excuse me. He lost most of the round, but he did buckle Allen's knees and obviously damage-based scoring criteria. That would swing the round to him being the guy who almost ended the fight. So, you know, two minutes top control and a slight edge and strikes landed. Hmm, doesn't really make up for that. So 
Chris Curtis, third round, I gave to him, so I had him up 29-28. Fourth round, it's a push. You could go either way. Uh, Allen had some control time, did land more strikes, did have you know some danger. Curtis had a nice reversal in there, so not without reasons to score the fight for him. You could have Curtis up 3-1. I had it 2-2. And then in the fifth round, it was very much a Chris Curtis round. He outstruck him. He outlanded him. He had him in the you know face down to the canvas position a couple of times when he tried to shoot for a takedown and could not get it and just got pounded on, got reversed one time again. And then, of course, uh, the injury happens in the last, what was it, like last 30 seconds of the fight, maybe? I think it was actually like, I think it was like last 10. Uh, but like less than a minute to go, he probably blows out his hamstring. And that probably is what's the, uh, is the fight. That being said, we look at the judges' scorecards. We have the judge who scored it the way I did, which is Derek Cleary. He gave rounds, essentially, he gave, it, with giving round five. So Derek Cleary, round one, four, and five to Allen. That's a fine scorecard. I have no problem with that. Judge Mike Bell had rounds one and five going to Allen, two, three, four to Curtis. Don't really have a problem there either. That's a, that's an okay card. It's not what I had, but it's an okay card. Well, neither was Cleary's. And then Eric Cologne, I uh, I don't know about this Eric Cologne card because he gave the third round to Allen and made it a 40 and 46. That's, uh, that's not good uh, because, like, let's face it, you can't, you can't barely win a round and then get buckled and still win the round. Like, this is supposed to be a damage-based scoring criteria. So, in that case, that card is bunk. But I really have no problem with this card going to Allen. Like I said, I scored rounds one and four for him. I think round one is a solid his round. And then round five is uh, you know has a hamstring pull in it. And it depends on what you count that as. You're counting that as damage that Allen created through the forcing of the grappling and the wrestling exchanges, then then yeah, he won this fight. I have no problem with it. Now, I do think that calling for a title shot off of beating a non-ranked fighter, or like, hang on, was Chris Curtis ranked? I always can't remember with middleweight because middleweight is... The bottom of middleweight's rankings are really, really, really flexible. Yeah, I don't see Chris... Yeah, okay, Chris Curtis was ranked. He was number 11. He drops to number 14. Losing spots to Kamsat Chemaev. Somehow, Anthony Hernandez ends up ranked at 12 after not being ranked before this. That's a little bit weird. Uh, like, obviously, you can see him picking up a spot over Chris Curtis, but why is he passing Kyle Bahio and Paul Craig? I don't really, uh, I don't really think I understand that one. Um, so, yeah, he beat the number 11th ranked guy. That's not really a case for a title shot. Also, there's frankly just a lot at the top of this division that is a title shot worthy. You got Shamaya fighting Robert Whitaker, which you know the winner is probably going to be somewhat in a position for a title shot. You have Sean Strickland having a rematch with DDP or with Izzy Adesanya, regardless of who wins their title fight, as an option. And then, of course, you also have a potential rematch between DDP and Israel Adesanya, depending on how you know that fight goes, because wild and wacky shit does happen. So... There is a chance that, you know, Brennan, Brennan Allen is like at best, at absolute best, the fourth guy in line for a title shot behind Strickland, behind the loser of DDP, Adesanya, behind the winner of Chemayev Whitaker, like at best. And I'd probably also put like Jared Cannonier in front of him because Jared Cannonier beat Sean Strickland and just kind of never really got the payoff off that, to be honest. So that's not happening. He did call out Sean Strickland. I don't think that's happening either because Strickland's talking about holding off and, you know, waiting for a title shot. So I've got Marvin Vittori. He's a teammate of Strickland. He's a teammate of Chris Curtis. He continues this extreme couture versus Brendan Allen feud. Maybe. Let it go on. Make it happen. I don't know. Curtis, I've got Ikram Alaskara. But realistically speaking... With that leg injury, he's probably going to be out a while. So we're probably going to see him reinserted into a middleweight division that is in a very, very, very different place than where it is now. People are, I think, being a little harsh to Allen here because they're like, man, he could barely beat Chris Curtis or, or whatever. I'm like, I just think Chris Curtis is a really, really difficult stylistic matchup for him. And it's not a stylistic matchup he's going to face from 
really anyone else at the top of the division. Like, if you really, really, really look at it, who else is Chris Curtis? For for good or for bad. I'm not, I'm not saying Chris Curtis is, like, better than any of these people. But on a stylistic level, they're not Chris Curtis. They're guys who like to go forward and be a little bit more aggressive. Chris Curtis is very, very happy to work on the counters. So you get that. And Allen's grappling game probably becomes more of a thing. And Allen's length probably becomes more of a thing. And Allen's counter game probably becomes more of a thing. So realistically speaking, this just isn't very, um, it isn't very germane to the rest of the matchups that he would possibly be facing, I guess, even though Sean Strickland and Vittori do train with, uh, with Chris Gers. Co-main event, Alexander Hernandez, Damon Jackson. I don't have a lot to say about this fight because Hernandez just got outworked. He, he, he got beat here. I scored all three rounds for Damon Jackson. Let's go to the box score, I suppose, to see if there's anything that maybe I sway on this one. Jackson outlanded him in all but the third round. Uh, I guess you got to give him the third round. I don't know. I, I I could watch it again, but like it's a single digit significant strikes from both guys sort of thing with Hernandez getting 27 total strikes to 16 total strikes. And they both had like two minutes top control. Jackson had a takedown. I don't know. It's not a very good round, essentially. But uh, yeah, Jackson definitely won the first two, I think. And somehow there was a card for Hernandez here that was 30 27. This is the best, this is the worst card on the night. 30 27 from Judge Brian Minor for Hernandez against Damon Jackson. Jackson was pressuring him, he was being aggressive, he was doing the damage that there was to do. He was outlanding him three to one in the first round, nearly two to one in the second round. Just ridiculous. Not a lot of significant strikes, obviously. A lot of insignificant strikes, like a lot of insignificant strikes. Like you had 22 in the third round for Hernandez alone. That's more than most people landed a fight. But uh, yeah, Jackson won this fight. And I'm just pretty much done with Hernandez at this point. It's not that he can't beat people. Like he's still a pretty good athlete. But the guy just seemingly can be just outscrapped. He's now lost to Damon Jackson. He's lost to Bill Algio. He's lost to Billy Quarantillo. These are all guys that he has significant athletic advantages over, and he cannot figure out how to capitalize that and make it actually work for him. So yeah, um, I just I just have nothing left for him. For Damon Jackson, I think a fight with Nathaniel Wood would actually be pretty fun because a big question with Nathaniel Wood is, of course, like how does the former bantamweight handle physicality and pressure and like a, a scrappy kind of like clinching wrestling game at 145. The answer is last fight was not great. So Damon Jackson is a guy to test that out. And also he's not for nothing, five foot 11. So, you know, he would bring that kind of frame to really ask that question. Cause I'm very, very, I'm, I'm very, very torn on where Nathaniel Wood is in this division. Morgan Charrier versus Chepe Mariscal. This was another fight that had, a controversial scoring. I scored it for Chepe. Now, if you scored it for uh, Morgan Charrier, this essentially comes down to the first round. I have no problem with that, but there are people calling this a robbery that I just, I think it's again that overuse of the word. So let's break it down. The first round starts out well for Charrier. He's landing good, straight shots and whatever, but he's not pushing the advantage which is a common problem for him. He's just not really a high work rate guy. He can be. He can be a high work rate guy, but he doesn't really want to be. So when Chepe Mariscal gets like super, super, super like, uh, you know, aggressive and let's be honest, a little bit sloppy towards the end of the round and gets a takedown and whatever and starts lighting up Charrier with some of the ugliest looking striking of the fight, I gave it to Chepe. Now, Chepe was bleeding from a cut uh, on his left eye. I believe it was the left eye. So you could say the damage went to Charrier, where Charrier did not absorb any like visible damage. That being said, Charrier does react relatively poorly to like every shot he has. He's like the anti-Bendo. He sells everything he gets hit with, whereas Bendo like no-sold everything he got hit with. So I would disagree. I think, <laughs> I think that's the key difference is that People think Chepe was hitting him more, but not hitting him hard. I think he was. I just think that he didn't, you know, get busted open and bleed. That's all. So I did give Chepe the round. If you gave it to Shari, I don't have a problem. 
Round two was Charrier's round. He picked up the pace. He landed 35 strikes. Compared to the 19, he landed in the first round and 21 in the third round and got it going. And then the third round was all Chepe. He got messy. Uh, although he did get taken down for like two minutes and plus of top control. But still, um, Charrier had no answer for the chaos that was coming for him and actually only landed six significant strikes. That's the thing. People are like acting like Charrier did a lot in the first round. He landed 10 significant strikes, 19 total. I know numbers don't mean everything. It's the quality of the strikes. Obviously, a strike that does nothing sometimes still gets counted as significant. And a strike that knocks someone down is obviously way more than that, but it's not like he knocked him down. Like The damage people are talking about was a minor cut beside the left eye of Chepe. He wasn't knocked down. He wasn't significantly buckled, I don't think. And realistically, that's all it is. Like He was a little bloody. I have no doubt that Charrier was winning whenever it was at range, but he could not keep it there. And he did not push the pace there. Like I said, 10 significant strikes. I think anyone that's getting butt hurt over Charrier losing this fight, and that includes me. I want to be clear. I picked Charrier to win. I bet money on Charrier. I stand before you as the aggrieved party. But no, <laughs> this, 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 was not, this was not a terribly officiate or judged fight. Uh, the officials actually were pretty good on the night. That's a, that's a positive, I guess. And in fact, the only scorecard that I think was bullshit was the descending scorecard from Adelaide Bird, who gave the third round to Chepe. 30-27. That's an Adelaide Bird card if I've ever seen one. So I don't have a problem with it. It was a good, fun fight. Chepe is over... Um just over in, in in general, like overachieving. I don't think I picked him a single time to win a fight. And now I think he's three and zero in the UFC. That is actually pretty insane. Like this guy was brought in basically to lose to Trevor peak. That's my honest opinion. And has now gone on to beat Trevor peak, Jack Jenkins and Morgan Charrier. That's, that's insane. That is absolutely insane. As for next opponents, I've got Chepe. Chepe versus Danny Silva, I think, would actually be a really, really fun fight. Battle of the Overachievers. But, like, at the same time, they probably want to go higher with him. And Chepe certainly would want to. So, like, maybe, like, a Jamal Embers or something. Charrier, I've got against uh, Lucas Alexander. Charrier is still 28 years old. He can fix this out. But, like, he does have a significant problem where, like, any close fight, he's going to leave the door open. Because he just... He just doesn't fully capitalize on the advantages he has, which are impressive. Ignacio Bahamandes versus Cristo Giagos. Uh, Giagos did his like glass cannon thing and just got kind of beat up. <laughs> got got hit with like a spinning back kick to the body and a head kick. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't I don't have much else to say. He got outlanded forty to seventeen in a three and a half minute period. Case in point. Ignacio Bahamandes landed almost as much in this fight as Morgan Charrier did in a 15-minute battle with Chepe. And people are super, super angry that he lost. Uh, anyways, he's, he was very excited afterwards to have uh, left high kick to guy who's a, 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 as an orthodox fighter. That was interesting. Uh, Bahamandes versus Ferris Zion would be a good fight. And Giagos, you're one and four in your last five. Your only win is over Ricky Glenn that's on the roster. I don't think anyone else is on the roster that you've beaten. You are a glass cannon. You are fighting Dana White Contender Series, guys. That is all. Um, if they keep you around. Trevor Peak versus Charlie Campbell was essentially this. When Peak got messy and abandoned the game plan, he did okay. When he tried to be a technical striker, he got absolutely beat up by Charlie Campbell. Both guys were able to take the other one down, but were like unable to really hold them down. Let's see here. What was the what was the top control time in this fight? Uh, so Trevor Peak had two takedowns for three minutes and 15 seconds, four takedowns for five minutes, 41 for Charlie Campbell, uh, Campbell, I had winning all three rounds, although I could see round two going to Trevor Peak because he did have a takedown to equalize Campbell's takedown. They landed the same significant strikes and they landed roughly the same total strikes. 
Peak probably getting the better damaging strikes in there. Uh, but no one gave him that round. And I, like I said, I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, judges Flores, Lieben, and Minor, in my opinion, doing their job. As for what's next, Trevor Peak is going to fight nothing but scrubs. That's that's what you do. This guy this guy just needs to go out there and be a violent, entertaining force. He's not, he's not going to win a title. He's 29 years old. He is not good at fighting technically. Don't try. Just let him do 2024 Chris Lieben stuff. <laughs> um, Campbell versus uh, Nicholas Moda would be a good fight. Alexander Morona more or less just pieced up. Uh, Court McGee, not really. Really much more to say about that. Court's 39 years old, and he looked it. I will defend the commentary team, which got a little bit of heat for saying that Court McGee is hard to put away, and there were a couple of people on Twitter being like, not lately. I'm like, yeah, but he used to be very, very, very hard to put away, and it's only been the last two fights that Court McGee's actually been stopped in the UFC, I'm pretty sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm willing to let that slide. Let me see here. Court McGee's finishes are Matt Brown, Jeremiah Wells. Okay, no, he had a 2006 stoppage loss to Santiago Ponce in EBO. But that's it. So, like, I, I think, <clears throat> in fairness, you could say Court McGee, even at 39 years old, still relatively hard to stop. And it's not a surprise that Alex Morona was unable able to do that. So, Morona versus Max Griffin, because I think that fight hasn't happened yet. And that feels like the, the idea. Court is either retiring or will be facing someone like the Ed Herman, Zach Cummins, sort of like off into the sunset fight. That that would be cool. I would be down for that. I, I am always down for that. Yeah, I was a big I was a big Court McKee fan. Still am, but it is it is that time. Uh Lucas Bresky versus Walter Walker sucked. Uh I scored a 29-28 for Bresky. I don't really have a way of getting Walker a victory. He did very, very little with his takedowns and landed very few shots, uh, I think, at the end of the fight. He's credited with four takedowns, 33 stri- significant strikes landed. Yeah, he got outstruck 135 to 56 total. Got outstruck in every round. The only, Like I said, the only one I gave him was basically just he got a takedown on Bresky and worked top control for three-plus minutes. That was it. I guess you could theoretically give him the first round. He worked three minutes and 16 seconds top control, but there just wasn't any, there wasn't any damage and there wasn't any striking. There wasn't, there wasn't any effective grappling beyond the takedowns. So that was disappointing. Someone did say that I was like overrating Walker because I was expecting some Johnny Walker stuff out of him, which is absolutely probably a little bit true, but like there is a little bit of Johnny Walker athleticism in him. He just, he doesn't let it out. Like, it's it's kind of ironic that, like, kind of similar to, like, Trevor Peak, Walker is fighting in a manner that doesn't lead to him winning. And it kind of has to be beaten out of him. And I would like to see that happen a lot more. Um, I don't really have any particular interest in these guys outside of, like, you could do Bresky against one of the Toffas. Let the Toffas strike. Go. Go forth and do that. Walker, I think, however, is a Dana White Contender Series uh, guardian until he... Until he figures some stuff out. He's 26 years old, so he's got time. And uh, heavyweight is a, you know, hyperbolic time. Uh, oh, what is the Dragon Ball Z thing? The time jaber. Oh, I forget what it's called now. I'm embarrassed now. My, my DBZ knowledge comes up lacking. But um, time moves very, very slowly. And you have a lot of time to figure your stuff out. So hopefully Walker can do that. Because he does have the physicality to do things. Norma Dumas versus JDR was terrible. I scored rounds one and three for Dumas. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I, I got very, very little to say about that. Uh, Dumas versus Ketlin Vieira. JDR versus Eileen, the winner of Eileen Perez and Jocelyn Edwards would make some sense. I will say this. Uh, people are saying this is not how Norma Dumas normally fights. I disagree. Now, Norma Dumont is not normally a takedown and control grappler. So the, in that regard, yes. But Norma Dumont will fight at the lowest pace and the lowest activity and the lowest violence that gets her a win, which is kind of frustrating. By the way, putting women's bantamweight and women's heavyweight back to back on cards should be a legitimate crime because this is unacceptable. <laughs> this is absolutely unacceptable. Moving on down, we had Pedro Pedro Falcao versus Victor Hugo. This was fine. 
Falcao came out and had a good first round to a certain degree. He managed to, you know, get a takedown. Hang on, let me let me pull up the stats on this one because I feel like that's going to be the king. Uh, round one was pretty inactive. Uh, Falcao putting up six minutes, 25 seconds of top control. But then he couldn't get a takedown after that. He went over for 9. Uh, got outstruck, but Victor Hugo was prone to getting backed into the cage. And therefore, we had a lot of, like, grinding stuff against the cage. And, uh, yeah, he came out with the win here in Yamps' decision. Bird Miner gave, I'm assuming, Falcao the first round. But given their track record, I'm not actually 100% certain on that. Oh, my God. Bird gave Falcao the second round? Okay, Chris Lieben, Brian Minder, you two get a pass. Minor has my card. Lieben has a 30-27. That is perfectly understandable. But Adelaide Bird gave Falcao the second round. He got outlanded. 24-14 significant strikes. 27-16 to 16 in total strikes. Went 0 for 5 on takedowns. And basically just had clinch control. Go away, Adelaide Bird. Go away. You've been gone a while. I would like you to stay gone. There you go. What's next for these guys? I honestly don't know what to make of this fight because it was super short notice. I guess Hugo could fight someone like Vinicius Lockdog Oliveira and Falcao could fight someone like... Honestly, just someone coming off Contender Series. Would make a lot of sense. Do, do this man a solid. Give him a, uh, give him a winnable fight because he took this on like three days notice. John Matsumoto versus Dan Argetta. This was fun. This was the good fight of the night. Argetta was out there. And to a degree, my concerns about Matsumoto were valid. He was taken down uh, a number of times. I think Argetta set a career high in this fight of nine takedowns. And he was able to kind of bully Matsumoto. But here's the thing. Matsumoto stayed very composed, very calm. Made him pay for like every takedown. And eventually, he's got a good guillotine and he used it. Strangled uh, Argetta unconscious in the second round. So, it was a good performance by Matsumoto. I still do think that there's a ceiling on him. But he faced a guy who I do think of as borderline UFC material in Dan Argetta. And he got the W. He got the stoppage. He looked composed. He beat up the leg with his low kicks. His counter game was on point and looked strong. So my concerns about him in the UFC were allayed nicely. And I'm not super worried about it anymore. He's he's a productive member of this Bantamweight division. And he's only 24 years old. So he will hopefully continue to get better. I would recommend as a matchmaking thing, a step up of this same sort of matchup, but with a better, like, more multi-pronged attack of Tony Gravely, who is a good athlete. He is a very bare-bones wrestle boxer, and let's see what happens, because there was still a lot of takedowns given up by Matsumoto. That is concerning. I just like the way that he handles that, 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 that stress. Argetta is perfect Dana White contender series. Welcome to the cage, guys. Let's see what you can do. You probably have been kind of a little bit of a can crusher up until now because we signed you with a nice, shiny, undefeated record. And just kind of do this again. Like, do this again. Like, take take the next Jan Masamoto and put them in, put him in there with Dan Argetta and see what happens. Dylan Budka versus Cesar Almeida was terrible um, until Almeida finished Budka. To be clear, it wasn't Almeida's fault. He was trying to be, like, relatively interesting and fun. It's just Budka's entire game was land one significant strike. One. Should be mentioned that there were two significant strikes landed in the entire first round. Oh my God. Budka's too small for the middleweight division, so it doesn't alleviate my concerns about Almeida being like kind of a guy coming into MMA pretty late, 36 years old, and having a kickboxing background that doesn't necessarily keep the range as much as you'd like. So it's middleweight. You can do things with him. You could have fun with him. Uh, Budka needs to drop to 170 probably uh, if he wants to be considered at all. I would say Almeida versus Claudio Hibaro would be a pretty fun fight. I don't care about Budka really though. Even if he drops to 170, I don't think he's a good enough athlete or a good enough physical presence to actually like 
make the fact that he has a very, very raw game work. Now, the only good side I can say about it, he is 24 years old. 24-year-old Dylan Budka can go forth, become better, and maybe in three, four years, I'm talking about him as someone who is actually there. Because he he's not a terrible athlete. He's just not a good enough athlete to make this raw of a game work. That's the problem. And, and not even very active. So there is raw building blocks there that I am intrigued on. But I don't know how this guy got signed off the Contender Series. <laughs> If it feels like this, this would be would have been one of those give him a developmental contract type deals. Melissa Mullins versus Nora Cornole. Cornole did really, really well, but she still gets backed up into the cage way too easily. Uh, and then eventually, she did end up stopping Mullins with a pretty cool body uh, body knee knee right to probably the liver, I'd imagine. And then she hit, so she hits her with the body knee, hits her with the head kick, ground strikes to finish it. They bring the bucket in for Mullins. So you know that was a hard shot. You know that shot loosened up some things inside of her. And uh, yeah, it was a really, really, it was a really impressive performance for Cornole. The only problem is, is that at 34 years old, I don't think she's going to fix the fact that she doesn't maintain range except by backing up into the cage. She needs sharper footwork or just a more active kind of like range probing game because well, even that wouldn't really work because she's five foot seven and sixty-seven inch reach, which you know, not short, not not, not a short reach, not a short height by any means. Um, at one thirty-five, but it's also not tall and it's not long. So she gets a W here. I still think that there's a ceiling on her. You could put her in there with Julia Avila. That I think that I think would actually be a fun fight. Hear me out on this. Avila is super aggressive and will back her to the cage, but she's also a completely non-existent defensive striker. So it would allow Cornoli to just like tee off on her and Avila to just push her to the cage. Like they they both legitimately have a path to victory. <laughs> and uh, and both of them are fairly violent paths to victory. So why not? And they're and they're they're targeting weaknesses that both of them need to work on to actually become better. And I like that. Uh, Mullins, I've got the rematch against Daria Zelezhnikova. Because if you've never watched that fight, it's just a it's a bit of a weird ending. And it feels like it's one that Daria would probably want back. And that Mullins would probably like to assert her dominance on. Because she's coming off a loss. So, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me. Also, I mean, it's women's bantamweight. This division was ignored for like five years of like not signing more than one fighter. And then we wonder why it has no depth. It's... It's the women's version of heavyweight, except that there is no real reason that it should be this bad. Like men's heavyweight is going to always be bad until the pay structure changes. Because just frankly, if you weigh 240 plus pounds and you're pretty athletic, you're doing football, you're doing basketball, you're doing uh, rugby, uh, depending on the country, you're doing things stuff baseball even you are you are elsewhere you are you you had pathways that allowed you in a physical sense to actually make money or 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 you're doing like pro wrestling even that's kind of always just going to be kind of crap but women's bantamweight there are women's bantamweight size people in like most gyms you go to go to a jiu-jitsu gym try it out there are some reasonably athletic women of that size it's just that you then have to have the willingness to fight and the fact that like a lot of people kind of just retired because they couldn't really find fights and the UFC wasn't really taking. So that's the thing. You you <clears throat> if, if the UFC is promoting something, the regionals will pick up the pace on it and develop things. So there you go. Next week, we don't have this lame UFC stuff because we have UFC 300 and that's Dominic. That's a that's a that's a that's a, that's a boss card. Um, I've made fun of it in the sense that like I still think the UFC over promoted it like like they kind of always do with these like hundred cards. But you've got three title fights. They're dope. You've got Armin Sergey and Charles Oliveira. That's dope. Bo Nickel shouldn't be on the main card, but whatever. Him versus Brundage will still be fairly fun. Rakic versus Brohaska is is a an interesting fight, a fantastic like a fantastically interesting fight. 
and probably an exciting one because Prohaska cannot be really made boring. Uh, Calvin Cater versus Aljamain Sterling. That's a good fight. I still have all kinds of like questions and bad feels, and I don't think Kayla Harrison should be making 135, but hey, she's fighting Holly Holm. Diego Lopez versus City Yusuf. That's a good fight. Bit high on the card. Jalen Turner versus Hanato uh, Moicano is on the card. That's a good one. Jessica Andrade, Marina Rodriguez. That's going to be a good fight. Bobby Green, Jim Miller, the OG battle. And then you've got Davidson Figueredo versus Cody, Cody Garbrandt as the opener. That is fantastic. There you go. That is great. That is stunning. From the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. Not at the Apex. Not a fight night. This is good. Everyone on this card is like, except for Cody Brunch. And I'm not even saying that as a negative of Cody Brunridge, to be clear. Like, Cody Brunridge got out on social media and was like, guys, you know it's not my fault that I'm on the main card against Bo Nickel. It's true. I don't fault him. I do not fault him. But he is, like, by a significant margin, the worst fighter on this card. Um, everyone else is very, very, very good. And, like, um, at one point or another has been considered, like, a prospect to actually rise up the ranks and become a, uh, if not a title contender and if not a champion, then at least somebody worth putting on a main card going forward. So that's dope. That's amazing. What else do we have coming up? We have a PFL card in four days time. PFL two. Anything really good? 205ers and lightweights. Yeah, it'll be pretty good. It'll be pretty good. There's there's not a whoa, 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 whoa. Let me let me let me pause myself here. There is a can't miss fight. Clay Collard versus Pitbull uh Patricky. Ooh. I like that a lot. Um, I like that a lot. That's going to be violent. Um, so yeah, you got that. Nothing else really can't miss, but like there's good stuff. I'm looking forward to J.J. Wilson versus Adam Piccolotti. I'm a big fan of J.J. Wilson. Um, I do I do kind of wonder if Lightweight's just going to see him get bullied periodically, but we'll, we'll find out. Probably not from Piccolotti, though. <laughs> Probably not from Piccolotti. So yeah, no, that's that's it's 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 a it's a good card, but their their production values tend to be tend to be pretty bad. So I'm gonna wrap it up there on that note, on this positive note of celebrating UFC 300 and BFL two for 2024 being relatively solid cards. The next week gonna be pretty good. So, anyways, check down below for the links to my Discord, social medias, and video gaming stuff. Check out the Discord, particularly for the fight simulator, and I. We'll talk to you guys either on Wednesday or Thursday. We'll see. Depends on where the schedule kind of sorts out. Things are getting busy at work, and uh, that can obviously lead to some things.